Hello, I'm Sima Down. And I'm Ella Lamara. And welcome to Two Spirit Tea. Woo! We would like to acknowledge that we are here on the traditional territories of the unceded land of the Silk people. And we are super excited to have our inaugural podcast episode. Yes, where we're going to talk about ourselves, which is our favorite topic. And then we're going to give our points of view on um, on pop culture, pop culture. and yeah, whatever recent events are happening. We're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about um, we're also going to teach a little bit about uh, some of our indigenous heritage, some traditional lessons. Yeah, that's pertaining to both of our 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 experiences. Yeah. So <laughs> so. Although this is two spirit tea, we are both two spirit people, but we don't speak for all two spirit people. So, yes, we're just here to give our point of view. Yes, and our opinions are based on once again our experiences and our within our specific cultural background. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think I think people get that. They're like, what we're saying is we are not professionals. We are not the leading authority on two spirit talks. We just have a vibrant two spirit life, and we just want to share our views on these amazing topics. Yeah, and I think yeah. we have like some very similar things about our our histories and who we are, but we also have some very different things. So I think we have a good broad range. What's also great too is that we have very different backgrounds, like you said. Like you um um grew up without your culture and your your um life. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with like with little fragments of my culture. And so yes. like yeah, so for me growing up, I as an adult I've kind of reconnected and um relearned in kind of an untraditional way, yeah. a lot of my traditional things. <laughs> but so like, I, I don't think that matters too much. It just means no. that you reconnected with your journey exactly. and then you took the time to like uh, build your cultural knowledge behind your back, which is pretty awesome to do, especially um, there's a lot of people that are uh, quote unquote white passing that don't care about it because sometimes their uh, parents or their family has put shame into it. So they don't want to learn. Yeah. And I think that's, that's definitely been my experiences. Um, I, there was definitely a lot of shame. There was definitely a lot of like growing up being told, don't tell people because you don't want to be seen as the drunks or the alcoholics or lazies or whatever negative stereotype they were all thrown at me. And I was told Mm -hmm. you're white passing, take that privilege and run with it. And so like, yes, I do acknowledge I have a lot of privilege as someone who's white passing, but, um, I try to make sure that I'm using my platform, my voice to amplify the people that don't have that same privilege. Yeah, exactly. And she's doing an awesome job at it. And I understand what you mean by, by privilege. Cause um, I'm a fair skinned indigenous person. So, and um, quote unquote, I'm fairly good looking. <laughs> <laughs> is pretty that privilege. Sounds... Is that going to be the new thing? Nope. <laughs> if there is such thing as a pretty privilege and there is such thing as um, um, since I'm not as dark, uh, there is a there was it was easy for me to bridge into the white realm, and uh, and I mean I think colorism is huge in like the black community as well though like yeah. it, it's it uh, crosses a lot of different races mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. the closer you are to white the more privilege you have yeah exactly and the more um more more admired you were so like me growing up I wasn't dark enough for my native side of the family and then I wasn't white enough for my white side of the family. Let's put back My mother is um, indigenous from the Yukon, uh, Cascadene, and my father is Métis from Manitoba. So um, even though I have quite a bit of indigenous in me, I still still fair skinned. Yeah, and for me, I am Métis on both my mom and my dad's side. Um, my settler part of my heritage is German, Irish, and British. Mm-hmm. But um, should we give our colonial names? I guess we should. Yeah, I think we should because we're also not going to be in drag for every one of these. And for those of you listening, you're like, why are you in drag if you're just listening to the recording after the fact? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Well, the reason why is because we're we're going to the bar for a gig after this. So, <laughs> yes, it's TikTok Tuesdays for anyone in the Kelowna area wants to see us later. <laughs> yeah. But uh, my colonial name is uh, Dustin Dufo, and that's the name that was given to me um, at the hospital. <laughs> At the hospital. <laughs> yeah, but I do have an indigenous name as well that a lot of people don't know about. My closest friends do know about it. But um, my name is uh, Dahikia, and my grandfather gave it to me the night I was born because he had a dream the night I was being born <laughs> of me um, wandering the um, the world. So um, Dahikia means the wanderer. And my other name is Mitchell, 
or Mitch, whatever. There should be some excitement in that because, you know. Sorry. Well, you know what's funny? Like, <laughs> growing up, I was very proud of being called Mitchell, and I hated the name Mitch. And I actually, like, used to... Uh, there was one time I like yelled at a supply teacher, got sent to the principal's office because she kept calling me Mitch. And I was like, that's not my name. Mm. Was, I hear that. I hated Dusty. Yeah. I flipped out. <laughs> I'm not dirty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I won't call you Mitch. I, and now, you got now over it? I got over it. And Same actually, with me. You yeah. can call me Dusty if you want. Most of the time. It was I just... better than Dustina through high school. <laughs> 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 at least you chose Ella as your drag name, not That's Dustina. Right. Yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> Hi, Dustina. This like shame just rolls on me every time someone says my name. <laughs> I don't have shame for Dustin. I had a great high school year. I just hated the name Dustina. How dare you like amplify my femininity. <laughs> So you mentioned as well that you you grew up in the Yukon, and so I grew up actually in very rural Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was an interesting, because we always, so we always had a farm, uh, moved quite a bit as a kid, but always in the same area. And like throughout, we always, farming, we always had different animals. So we were never like a huge, just like a little hobby farm, but we had like uh, horses for a bit. We had cows, pigs, chickens. Mm -hmm. Every, like sheep, turkeys, pheasants, everything you can think of, we had it yeah. at one point or another. And you mentioned that you were living in rural um, uh, Ontario, but also your your father is very connected to the land. So he taught you a lot of like hunting and fishing and things like that, right? Yeah, like from the time I could walk, I was hunting and fishing. Like I, mm -hmm. I went and shot my first deer at eight years old, like could barely, hadn't even, <laughs> hadn't even hit puberty yet and out there. And hunting. killing things. <laughs> and, <laughs> And trapping, like I always, I always joke, like I didn't really get an allowance growing up. We just sold fur, and that's how I made money as a child. Yeah, so did I. We didn't get allowance, probably like we were poor, but we um, I had a little little trap line around our cabin, me and my sister, and we'd catch rabbits. And um, throughout the winter, we'd uh, skin them. And don't like us looking at ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there was a monitor in front of us, and I was looking at myself quite a bit. This is the vanity coming out because once again, pretty privilege. But I think it's but good to look <laughs> in the camera sometimes too. You know, we don't. We're looking at each other. We're each connected. Other. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. we're connecting. All right. We're friends. We know each other. We built this relationship. Friends. Who are you? What's, what's your <laughs> what's name your again? Name again? <laughs> Anyways, back to my story. We had a, a little little trap line, and we caught rabbits throughout the winter. And my sister and I would skin them and um, uh, tan them. And then oh. at the fall, we would uh, sell them, sell the hides. See, I never, so spring, sorry, the spring. I never learned to tan, but we um we had a huge trap line. So my dad so was I actually, shouldn't say that we stretched them to oh, dry yeah, them out. Yeah, 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 stretch and dry. Yeah, yeah. And like, so yeah, my dad was the, like the president of the Fur Harvesters Association in my yeah. home area, um, and so like we had huge trap fancy. line. And like as a kid, it was like learned muskrats first, and then weasels and squirrels. We were always out hunting squirrels, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then got to go bigger animals like beavers. And but also like squirrels are big in Ontario, aren't they? Not they're not like the city squirrels. We're in the country, so they're just normal size. Okay, so the city squirrels are bigger. city squirrels are huge. <laughs> yeah, they're huge. That's what I remember in um in uh, Eastern Canada. I remember like a squirrel. It's like oh, that's a toonie. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but also um, well, I'm not older than you, but. Close to 20, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> As when when you, I was when, a youth, there was no toonie. Let's put it that way. <laughs> when you're a kid, a toonie goes a long way. Yes, it really does. Uh, we had the $2 bill. Sorry, that was me when I was younger. We got a $2 bill. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, re I remember some of them, but like, I don't think we've had toonies since I was. <laughs> yes. They've been around for a while. Yeah, $2 bills were not common. I remember they were <laughs> they were already an antique when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyways, yes. But the skinning... Uh, God, I had a story about that, and then I got excited about saying that I, I know about $2 bills. <laughs> <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> Never mind. Um, skinning, yeah. Woo. All the Gen Zs and millennials watching are like, oh, she's really old. Yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, skinning, we well, a um, little background story for myself, since I already said that I grew up in the, the Yukon, uh, uh, around Tulidlini, which is the indigenous name for Ross River, where we mostly grew up. And then it was the Ketsa Valley where my father went and built his cabin. And then me and my mother and sister lived in that cabin with no running water and no electricity. When the winter came, um, it completely snowed over the road. So there was really no in and out unless you had a skidoo. And in the, the Yukon in the winter, it's flipping cold. So it's not like you're going to go 30 miles to go into town. So you just stayed out there all the time. So we had to make sure that we had our all our supplies to last the winter. And then we 
skinned all winter, like trap lines get all winter. So I had to learn all that when I was younger, but I thought it was pretty cool. Like my dad's sitting there like skinning out this big, big ass wolf while I'm sitting there beside him thinking I'm all amazing and manly with my little rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> but also that's still a skill. Would I be able to like skin a rabbit again? You know, maybe I might have muscle memory, but um, I just remember my, my grandmother who's been doing it forever. She would just like, you know, two seconds, just around, quick but like loop they, around the legs, around the legs, and then just pull down. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just cut a little around the, the leg area and then start pulling the skin down and you yeah. pull it right over the head. Yeah. And was... I'm like sitting here trying to pull my fingers getting all bloody and mm -hmm. sticking to the fur. And then my grandma would backhand me and grab it <laughs> saying you're ruining it. <laughs> so, see, I, I am confident that I could still skin a muskrat. Mm. Like no problem. Just we never had muskrats. So I didn't have to worry about that, but we did have weasels. Weasels. If, and okay, beavers is one thing I had to learn how to skin. Yes, but weasels, if you don't do it right, it really stinks. Mm, that's if same you, with um, a wolf. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you accidentally puncture into the guts, it's disgusting. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I feel like we should probably turn the conversation away from skinning right now. People are probably like, this is not well, what I'm we having, came here to I'm having so much memories popping up because of the skinning. Well, I, was, I, I remember was, like the wolves, like you obviously don't want to puncture. And then same with beavers, don't want to puncture. Yeah. But I wasn't allowed to skin those when I was younger because that was our money maker and they didn't want to have holes in it. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to do those until like quite a f until I was like a preteen. Yeah, <laughs> so then I was allowed to touch them. Mm -hmm. But like, I was gonna say, I actually learned to sew and hand stitch from doing fur because we used to enter um, fur harvester competitions, and that's where the real money maker is. And so you'd have to like um, for regular furs, you don't have to like sew up all the leg and eye holes and all that. You just do the, dry them as they are and. Yeah. But when for competition, you needed to sew up every little hole and make sure everything was extra clean and pristine. And so that's how I learned to sew. Oh. But my sister was always better than me at it. And how so she would she? always get first place and I'd get second. Oh. Well, at least it stayed in the family. <laughs> really? <Yeah. Well, laughs> my favorite was the year that she entered. That she broke her finger? No, she... <laughs> Because she's a year older than me, so she entered the teen category when I was still, and I was a year below her. So yeah. I was in the, I was the top of the younger category. Yeah. So that year I got first in all, everything. <laughs> like yes, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure it was probably a money cash prize. So yeah, it was. I loved it, it right? Was, and I don't remember how much it was. It was probably like twenty five bucks for, but you would get that for. For a muskrat, for a squirrel, for a weasel. So mm -hmm. that's like seventy five dollars. And as a kid, that's a good day. That is a good day. Remember when twenty dollars was amazing? Yeah. <laughs> now we're like, what are we gonna get? A Starbucks order? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I learned how to sew because obviously living in a cabin at the base mountain without people around, um, I started sewing <laughs> for my sister's Barbies. But then we also learned how to do uh beadwork because my mother uh uh with the hide that we would make, we we tanned a little bit. It wasn't huge for us, but my grandparents did that, and then we get it. But she would make moccasins and mitts, and then they'd bead the designs on it, and then sew it all together. And then we'd use the the hides from the the beaver or the rabbit around the edges. Wolf, if we got it, yeah. Nice. I wish so I learned how to do as that. a kid. I I taught myself recently. Yeah, it looks good. I mean, you're not wearing it now, but no, it, it does. The one that's sitting at home looks great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely a skill, and it's something that you have to take time and consideration too. Because I remember I would just throw the beads on no matter what, but my mother has to make sure that every bead matches. So if there's any discrepancy in the bead, it it didn't get used. So everything had to be unified. Yeah, and she you said she beaded this that you're wearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for those of you listening, you should subscribe to Unicorns Live if you're uh, watching this after the fact or listening to this after the she fact. Didn't do these ones though because these ones were bought. <laughs> <laughs> so um, should we talk about how we started drag? We could, or do we want to give like a little history on Two Spirit before we keep going? Okay, maybe, that, maybe <laughs> we'll go there first. We just had like a great little conversation yeah. about a bit of our growing up, but you're going to hear a lot of that throughout our, our rants. Yeah. I'm not a rant. No. My life is not a rant. It's not a rant. My These storytelling. Are, yeah, storytelling. My history. Educational conversations. <laughs> That's right. Educational enlightenment for them. <laughs> the listener. Okay, so Two Spirit. Mm hmm. Uh, the term was adopted in 1990. I always thought it was like 1997. Then. 1990 was when it was proposed. But it, like, it wasn't, it was a Manitoba. It was a Manitoba, yeah. Oh, why did I think that was 1997? Maybe because it was Spice Girls year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I literally double checked this this morning to okay. make sure that I was right. <laughs> I was like, because for some reason, 97 or no, 96 always sticks in my mind. I was like, I don't know why, but yeah. That's so Britney Spears' year. 
<laughs> it's her year. No one else. Nothing else happened that well, year. Was the year she came out with her single? Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, it was. Um, it's actually originally an Ojibwe term, mm -hmm. and that's literally like the direct translation, basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, almost almost every indigenous culture has more than two genders. Yeah. Some have like Cree has six, five or six. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and they're. It's uh, people who were two-spirit traditionally held places of honor within their communities. Yeah. Yeah, they did. I shouldn't say that. I, I don't know about mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, uh, whether they were healers, their intermediates, uh, mm -hmm. they would do conflict resolution. Like medicine men. Yeah. Or women. Medicine gender. I don't know. Medicine people. Medicine people. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and they... Um, and the what was great about that culture is that they also in most in most cultures they um weren't strict with gender roles either. So like mm -hmm. if someone who was two spirited, they could they could flip back and forth. So they were yeah. One uh, day they could be gathering gatherings gathers and nurturers. Yeah. Or they can go out hunting. Exactly. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so essentially two spirit is a anti colonial word to take back for us indigenous queer people to call ourselves a word because uh, gay and lesbian was a colonial term that was forced on us. And unfortunately at the time and still at the time, it has a very negative connotation to it. Not anymore, but I mean like the people that gave it to us, you know what I mean? Well, originally like in the, the residential term, school system, gays became very, very hated within the indigenous communities because obviously the shit that happened. Well, sorry. Sorry. I was, I was going to say originally when the, um, Settlers came here, colonizers. They called uh, Burdashi, 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 Burdash, 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 which uh, like it literally means a uh, boy who gets sodomized. Yeah, and yeah, it's a very negative term. And then, like you're saying with residential schools, so it's important for people to know that like residential schools were absolutely terrible to everyone who went there, but people who were gender diverse and two spirited got it a lot worse because the very first thing they would do when you would get taken to residential school is you were divided by gender. Mm -hmm. Boys had one lesson plan, girls had another. But they also had separate buildings too. Exactly. And they were never able to intermingle. And so anybody who's gender diverse or gender variant or anything, they were being forced into these societal roles that they had never, mm -hmm. that they weren't mm -hmm. natural to them. Mm -hmm. And if they tried to fight back or if they tried to resist, they were punished extremely harsh. Mm -hmm. And then... And then on top of everything that happened in the residential schools and the community afterwards, they, um, they've now imposed Christianity on a whole generation or generations of indigenous people. And they've brought back the stigma of hating queer people mm -hmm. to their communities. And so now they, so not only did they um, force two spirit people into the closet or kill them, in residential schools they created they, a hatred they've created hatred in their own communities so they were now outcast from their families yep so creating the two spirit and finding a i don't like the word pan indian because obviously indian has a it's it's not who we are but um pan indigenous i don't know it's still called pan indian i believe but um it became a word for everyone to use to take away our our take away from colonialism and to name ourselves something that has a meaning of honor Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is great because uh i um never took on two spirit the word when i first heard it i thought it sounded great but i also didn't think it was me because i always fought against my um my femininity is like no uh there's shame to have that let's not have that in my life because obviously we grew up in a in a white world so i say and then for some reason femininity was considered uh terrible and bad and something to not want to um to embrace so obviously, like I pushed aside, pushed aside, didn't want to the brace with it. And as I became more in tune with who I was, I was like, Two Spirit actually really like speaks to me. It really is a word that uh embraces who I am as a person. Yeah, and I very similar, I struggled embracing my femininity for so long growing up. And then when it came to um figuring out how I identified, like when I started drag, I had a lot of people around me being like are you doing this just because you want to transition? Are you actually just like, what? Are you actually You're not a, girl? a woman? And I was <laughs> like, 
<laughs> I know my soft and feminine voice, <laughs> but, um, and I actually like, I got really introspective and really thought about my own gender identity in a way that I hadn't really before. And I was like, no, I think, I think I, uh, identify as like gender queer or fluid. And then I actually didn't originally identify as two spirit because I was like, am I indigenous enough? Am I, as this white per passing person, am I able to claim this identity looking the way I do? Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was really, th but also in the back of my mind is that seems like the label that I like the best. That seems to describe me the best mm -hmm. is having the masculine and the feminine spirit and being able to connect the two. That's, that's how I saw myself. But I was like, can I, do I have the right to take this label, which also comes with, like we said before, such a huge honor because mm -hmm. these were people who were ceremonious, like had huge place in ceremonies in indigenous culture. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had to, I spoke to a lot of uh, two spirit people that I knew and um, really asked them like, look, I am Métis, but I didn't have a traditional upbringing. I was very whitewashed. There's bits that I was, but I'm trying to reconnect. Can I claim this? And they're like, if it feels like you, if that feels the way that you, if that is how you feel and you are in fact an indigenous person, then you can take that label for yourself and you can reclaim it and you can mm -hmm. be yours. Yeah, that's perfect. And now you claim it and you realize you, oh, you do have a sense of honor to yourself. Or yeah. You do deserve the honorific, right? And what's beautiful about Two-Spirit is that it's a, it's an umbrella term for any queer indigenous person. But also I don't want to like anyone that's listening, uh, just because someone is indigenous and queer does not mean that they're Two-Spirit. They have to take that label on for themselves. We can't give it to them. Because yes. once again, what is that? Colonial. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyways, lovely story. I appreciate that. I'm happy that you do feel strong enough in your own self now to be able to call yourself how you feel you should be called. Does that make sense? That sounds very weirdly worded. Yeah, that made sense. <laughs> I think a lot of these conversations are going to be very weirdly worded. Okay. And sometimes okay. there's just, there's not a right way to say things. There you go. As long as you all get the gist, I'm judging. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> So should we talk about how we started drag now that we've kind of... How we started drag and got a little bit of two-spiritedness out of the way? Yeah. Um, <laughs> two-spiritedness out of the way. Not yeah. like our whole show is based on that. <laughs> throw Let's throw it out the door. Where's, where's, all right, where's Welcome Wayne Ella? Welcome to tea with Simba. <laughs> <laughs> Simba and Ella. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Um, how we started drag. Well, my my drag journey had nothing to do with me being two-spirit. Um, I've wanted to do it for years and years and years. And I remember seeing drag performers... And um, thinking they were great. And when I were first started going to the bar, it was pre-drag race. Uh, so you would meet these drag performers, but there was such a diversion, division in the community where everyone actually hated drag queens and they loved watching them, but they didn't ever wanted to date them. They never really wanted to be their friends. It was always just the feminine ones that wanted to like, be their friends or, or future drag queens. It was just a really weird situation because like everyone loved watching them, but no one wanted to be friends with them. And I remember having the shame. I was like, do I want this? Like, I just grew up uh, in northern Yukon in northern BC having to fight for who I was. And now if I become a drag queen, do I want to take on this this new fight? So I just never did it. Pushed it aside. And then finally, um, my friend here in Kelowna was having a drag party. And I was like, do you know what? I was like, screw it. I'm just going to do it. So I just went all out, all ham. Uh, thought I looked amazing. Like I bought all the expensive stuff, which was silly because it was only <laughs> going to be one night. But looking back, was it expensive? Yeah, my one outfit was over $1,000 for my first night doing wow. drag. Yeah, and then I bought all the makeup, all the things. And then I bought for Robin. So for us, that one night for all the makeup and Robin and wigs and heels, it was like $3,600. Jesus. Cause <laughs> 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 yes, I went, I went hard on this thing. And then afterwards when I was done, and I still didn't look that great. <laughs> Granted, I looked better than my friends, but just because I had natural feminine beauty. <laughs> but um, I remember telling Robin, who now was my husband, my boyfriend at the time, I was like, do you mind if I keep doing this? I had a really good time and I don't want to stop. And I was like, and plus I just spent all that money. <laughs> Robin was like. <laughs> That's Robin why like, you spent all the money yeah, so that he would be yeah, like, exactly. oh, there's an investment. I guess we can't let it go to waste. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thankfully Robin was like, you know what? Like, uh, if this is what you want to do, go for it. 
And once again, at the time, not once again, I didn't even say this before, there was no drag community in Cologne at the time. So me wanting to do more drag was essentially just me dressing up by myself. <laughs> just dressing, <laughs> just being a crossy yeah, going out to the bar. No big deal. I didn't do that because like I wasn't confident enough at the time. We should tell people we use crossy as a term of endearment. Oh, yes. As a term of endearment, always. <laughs> Gus, let's have a moment We're of canceled, silence. Canceled, so we canceled really on the first canceled. episode. <laughs> but um, yeah, so then uh, thankfully I met friends in Kelowna and then started doing more drag. And then through drag, I was able to embrace my femininity, which was also at the time where I started reconnecting with my heritage as well. Because when I was younger, in my early 20s, there was um, a lot of drugs. And uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a future in a episode. future episode. But yeah. Um, <laughs> As I got older, I started embracing my community, embracing like the queer community as well as my heritage, heritage, heritage background, heritage. I don't know my heritage, indigenous. my indigenous <laughs> background, and then embracing being a feminine person, and then it just all started melding perfectly together. And then I was in university as well, and I was um, becoming a very big um, indigenous advocate. And then uh, Two Spirit found my way, and I was like. This is this is really who I am. I do feel like I can bridge between the masculine and the feminine. And then after embracing my indigenousness, my two spiritedness, my femininity, I started becoming a stronger person, uh, insanely confident, uh, probably a little overconfident. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just it just blossomed into who I am today, which thankfully a lot of people like may rub a lot of people the wrong way, but they come around. <laughs> I just never go away. <laughs> Back to you, Simon. Back to me. <laughs> so for me, starting drag. So I, like I said, grew up in a small town. Never saw any drag queens. Barely saw any gay people to, at all. Then I moved to Fort McMurray. And I still was very much in my little, I'm a mask boy, mask for mask. I don't know what into all that gay stuff. Was that your mask voice? That was my mask voice. Do you like that? Hey, Ben. You want me to go down lower? Yeah. <laughs> Do you like that? Is that where you want it? Thanks, Ben. I'm just picking up my pen. <laughs> But yeah, so like I was in Fort Mac and I was very much like in my own little world, not a part of a queer community in any way. Then I moved to Halifax for university and almost immediately when I got there, kind of started seeing this guy who had done drag a couple times. And so he brought me to my first drag show. And I remember thinking like, oh, I'm not going to like this. What are, what is, what is all this? Um, <laughs> saw saw my drag mom, Rouge Fatale, take the stage. It's the first queen I ever saw. And I was mesmerized. I was like, how is she so confident? This whole, she's so funny. She's so boisterous. And I was like, I want that. That's I'm like, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And so literally three months later, um, I was organizing a charity drag show for my university and um, I had booked her and I was like, Hey, like I really want to do it too. Can you put me in drag for the show? And she was like, Ugh. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so <laughs> how'd I know that was the response? <laughs> put me in drag and I looked a hot mess. I didn't have boobs. I had a huge <laughs> butt. Like you think my butt's big nowadays. Huge. huge i was also i'd also like at that time just lost like 100 pounds and so i was super skinny and skinny waist big butt huge butt <laughs> i i did not spend a lot of money on this i borrowed a really shitty fried wig um i, I saw the heels she gemmed up had pay less <laughs> little booties and i actually didn't even gem them up that was someone else after the fact <laughs> and i borrowed a little black dress <laughs> and that was <laughs> but didn't you win it wasn't a competition. Oh, it was kidding. it was all established queens, and then just me there. <laughs> I, but I had an amazing time. I performed terribly, but uh, Taylor Swift. Yeah, I did yeah. Taylor Swift <laughs> and Iggy Azalea, very white. <laughs> um, and I was like, at the time, I was like, I don't know if it's going to be a thing or if it's just a one off. But I ended up um, making some amazing friends. I also should point out at the same time I mentioned it before. Then I was like not involved with the queer community, very mass for mass, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, I really educated myself on queer history and um, everything that I'm such an advocate for now. 
Um, so yeah, that was all the same time as starting drag. I found a queer family that was also a lot of new drag queens mm -hmm. and we became so close that we really, some of my best friends to this day. And, um, yeah, I, um, I was about to say, like, you make a really good point. Um, when you start into drag and you find a good drag family or you start a really good friends, like that also helps to build you up and build who you are and helps to nurture and, uh, essentially like, take care of your mental health. Because, like, when I started drag here, there was no one else. But then I met my close friend, um, Sasha Zamolchakova, and then we built something fun together, and then we created a great time. Just like you said, you had your drag family who are still good friends with you now. Yeah, it was Marsha Mello and um, Mona Pleasure. Mm -hmm. I the love Marsha. Met her. No, no talked to her. Talked to her. And talked to Mona, too, didn't I? Yeah, you've talked yeah. to Mona, too. The three of us were just, like, the three musketeers. We, we all started within a few months of each other, and, like, um, so, and then so many others in Halifax too, though, really solidified this queer family that I'm still so thankful for. And, and like, it makes a difference because if you grow oh, up I, in a situation where you don't feel the most love and support and then all of a sudden you have all of this love and support, you're like, I can do anything. <laughs> yeah. We used to do like Sunday dinners and I would cook for everybody and um, like, yeah, I miss them so much and, mm -hmm. but like still so close and it, it honestly helped my mental health so much at that time. Yeah. Also, another question that's a little bit different. Um, when you first moved away from your small town and you're an adult and you had a queer community, did you go really gay? And when I say that, I just mean like when I was finally un out from under the uh, impact of my, my old community where it's like, no, 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 gay, don't do that stuff. It's like family. And then, um, <laughs> then I was out on my own. I was like, okay, I'm going to wear the tiniest belly shirts. I have like these tight as pants that flared out like bell bottoms and I tied ribbons to my pants all the time. And I was just like running down the street with my hand in the air being like, yay, I'm gay. That was not my experience because <laughs> so like me leaving my little hometown, I went to Fort McMurray where my mom had moved to already. So like mm -hmm. it was just from family. I was with more family and I was still in a very small <laughs> conservative community. So I just be, yeah, it did not happen to me. Maybe okay, a different little experiences. <laughs> maybe when I moved to Halifax a little bit okay. more. And I was, yeah. Not me. I was running down that street with glitter, like flying all over the place. Yeah. I just, I went um, very gay, which is nothing wrong with that. I use that in a term of like endearment, just like crossy. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Like I just, I went hard. You were hard. very thin point. You were making I up went, for lost time. Yes. I just went hard. Yeah. So. <laughs> So now that we've established a lot of our background, how we yeah. started drag, should we talk about how we met? How we met? Well, we met because she was stepping on my toes. Excuse me. <laughs> so we, well, we actually almost met for the parade. Yes, but you had to go home for something. Yeah, uh, I was living in Fort funeral. McMurray at the time, and so was she. And then, um, because my husband's family is from that area, I keep looking at the camera. My That's husband's right. family is from... Fort McMurray. So he went up there because he got a job. So I followed him up there. And then I was there for a few years and then didn't do any drag. And then we started a pride committee there. And I jumped on to be a part of that, not to actually help out. I just wanted gay friends. <laughs> <laughs> and then we they had a Canada Day parade and they asked me to be a part of the float, which in turn there was supposed to be three of us, me, uh, Sima Down, and this other girl, Massey Isis Rain. And then... um. Unfortunately, Simba couldn't be there, but I can forever take the title that I was the first drag queen in any parade in Fort McMurray. There you go. That's me. <laughs> yeah. So I had just moved back to Halifax that May. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, so that was July. And then I found out what it was literally a couple weeks after I got back to Fort Mac that this pride committee had got a rainbow crosswalk painted and it was in the newspaper that, Oh, they're starting a pride here. And I was like, so excited. And I was like, I want to join and get in on this. She hated me at first. Cause I was I, the person on the float. I did not hate you at first. <laughs> I do remember the photos I saw. She were, said, who's those ugly Queens out there? <laughs> I did say that the photos I saw were really bad. And I She's was like, like, I'm prettier. I was <laughs> like, who's this queen in jeans? Which was not oh, you. That wasn't me. <laughs> but anyway, so I was like, I'm going to uh, have a drag show in Fort Mac, which there mm -hmm. had been a few little shows in the years prior yeah. uh, for like, but only for Halloween, I think. And yeah. so I think this is going to be the first 
Well, no, Massey used to have his anti bully um, thing once a year. But Close to Halloween, though. Was that Halloween? Yes, Around that's Halloween. Right, it was October. So it was, yeah, so it wasn't the first strike show. I can't claim that. But it was, uh, I was organizing it for the Pride After Party. And so. I yeah. stalked you on Facebook to find yeah. you, and I was like, hey, I want to do a drag show. Do you want to be in it? Mm -hmm. And I remember at a Pride meeting before that, uh, they asked me if I wanted to um, spearhead a Pride uh, a drag show, and I remember being like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just because like, I know how hard it was to um, build a community in Kelowna. And then um, thankfully, Sima was there, and she jumped full full total into it, and I was like, I will help out. <laughs> I was like, but I just don't want to do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> Thankfully, Sima has strong, calloused hands. So she's Broad <laughs> shoulders, <laughs> fat ass. Strong legs. She can lift things. Yeah. I'm dainty and petite. <laughs> dainty and petite. But anyways, so yeah, so we had our first um, drag show on for the Pride after party that year. And it was which, great. Like the turnout was fun. And it was lovely. Yeah. Actually, well, that Pride Festival. So Fort Mac's first Pride Festival, mm -hmm. I showed up in drag and I had this beautiful like peacock, uh, huge pride peacock thing. thing yeah um but i literally had like a lineup of people wanting to meet me which was so amazing mm -hmm. and i remember my mom came down on her lunch break to see me that day and she was like afterwards she was like i finally get why you do this she's like i've always supported you i've never had an issue but seeing the joy that you bring to people she's like i finally get it changes it. eh it's amazing and then and that was when i first met you too that yes that was the first time we met was um, i wasn't in drag but i just got back from holiday yeah. And I probably wouldn't have done drag. <laughs> You'd do drag that night. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Then we had our first show, which was crazy busy. I, yeah. the, I think the most packed drag show I'd ever been in at, up until then. Yeah. Fort McMurray loves drag. A lot of people don't think it, but Fort McMurray loves drag. But you know what? It was crazy. So do you remember that day um, the Hells Angels had booked that entire hotel oh, that we had right. the show at? Oh, that's right. And they were worried because it was um, Pride and it was a Hells Angels thing, but they were amazing. Yeah, well, literally that morning, the RCMP called me and they're like, are you having this event at this place? And like, this are you announced? sure? And I was like, yes. And like, are you aware that the Hells Angels are staying at that hotel that you're having this event at? And I was like, nope, but <laughs> don't care. And they're like, we think you should cancel it. And I was like, I'm not. <laughs> but weren't they really supportive at the end of the night? They were loving well, Stella, the weren't they? The police were came and like made sure no one who was wearing any biker paraphernalia was allowed in the bar. Oh, I don't remember any of that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I have adoring fans around me, I don't see anything else. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so then we did, we just kept organizing more drag shows yeah. in Fort Mac. And then you moved back to Kelowna. And then I moved Kelowna. back to Kelowna, which was the best choice. You know, I like, I love Fort McMurray. It, it was a very big learning curve as, um, just for, for me as a person. But um, after my third winter and we had, I think, 36 days of minus 30 degree weather plus each time with like the wind chill sometimes at like 57 degrees, minus 57. I was like, Robin, I'm moving. <laughs> I was like, with or without you. I was like, but I cannot do another winter in this town. So thankfully he was like, nope, I'm good to go too. And then um, we thought about where to move. And I was like, well, like, let's just go back to Kelowna. Like you said you miss it there. My closest friends are there. My strongest connections. So then we came back to, to Kelowna, and I'm happy that we did. I see this Kelowna as my forever home, but I know that I'll probably end up moving at one point, but I do feel I'll come back to retire here. Well, maybe not. Like, prices keep going up. I have to be flipping rich to be able to afford something <laughs> like get <I'm> back. <laughs> we just need to get you on a winning drag race. So that way you can afford, to, go, drag afford race. to live here. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, um, I still live in Fort McMurray. I'm in Kelowna for the summer. Mm -hmm. Do love it here, but mm -hmm. I also... I've become such a part of the Fort McMurray community. It, uh, if and when I do leave, it will be hard to go. And she makes good coin, fucking oil. <laughs> <laughs> so he will just unsubscribe. They're like, oil, yeah. oil, i out. spirit, tea, oil, <laughs> dare it. <laughs> but maybe we should talk about a little bit what we do in our communities now. I don't do anything. I just dance a fool in front of a stage and make crude jokes. I mean, I think you do more than that, even if you don't... <laughs> don't think it like you do a lot like, of I bring joy and I'm nice and I do a lot of like two spirit talks like I will say that I was yeah, like but um am I an advocate do yeah. I have a deep hand in the current um pride committee no I don't and the reason why I've never taken part of that is because I I'm I was quite a busy person <laughs> but I am getting quite busy again and I'm having another thing under my belt just didn't seem like something that I would be able to do if I wasn't able to give it my all because I'm focusing really heavy on my drag career you know what I mean? 
Yeah, but I feel like even though you aren't on the Pride Committee, your influence is still felt there. Like you created Kelowna's Drag Superstar, which has become one of their biggest events, has it not? It has, but you know, they made it bigger than I did. Did I, I start know. it? Yes. Yeah. But did they do amazing with it now? Yes. But are you still a part of a lot of things? Yes, you are. I just try, well, yeah, I'm just like saying, I said, like I am a part of a lot of things. I just okay. don't take the time to like organize and, and build things. Yeah. I guess. Am I kind? Yes. Do I put a smile on yes? Do I give myself the title Kelowna Sweetheart and Two-Spirit Goddess because I'm egotistical? Yes. <laughs> Do I, I hope that the more people hear it, they believe it? Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying don't sell yourself short because you I'm not are selling a huge short. part of this community. I purposely wear five-inch heels to not feel short. <laughs> but anyways, that's enough about you. So <laughs> things that I do. So I, I am the president of Fort McCrory Pride. I... Um, I am the vice chair of the regional advisory committee on inclusion, diversity and equality for our municipality. Um, which means I basically it's myself and a f- other people on that committee that, um, advise our municipal, our municipal government on how to be more inclusive. I, um, with my work, I'm on the planning committee for our, employee network for lgbtq2 plus employees i also She's sit a busy girl sit on the, our, our, the arts council wood buffalo on the board of directors and i do a lot of other little mm-hmm. things here and there like oh i like i do story time at our library i do i do a lot of outreach with the schools a little bit less this last year because of covid but mm-hmm. Do you feel that you would still do all these things if you were performing five to six times a week and your full-time job? No. <laughs> this <laughs> not taken away. I, I'm not no, taking away. Not, that's why I'm saying I'm not taking <laughs> away from you either. I'm not just because mine has like a bigger list, but that's yes, because we only do shows every couple months in Fort Murray. Um, so doing story time and doing a lot of this advocacy work is how I fill my time and fill my schedule. And she's great at it. She's great with children. I tried to do a story time and it's just, I don't know. The little the little hands trying to touch me. I'm like, can't do this. They touch you? Well, I just I, maybe I'm scarier. They don't try to touch maybe. me. <laughs> <laughs> just get too close, you know. I'm like, Ugh. love kids, just not while I'm in drag. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's like just don't touch me. They always try to pull your wig off. <laughs> they never. They kids never. are not drag friendly. I always. But drag is kids friendly. Does that make sense too? Just yeah. squish it over. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you do a lot of things in Fort McMurray. And I know that you do, do, do a lot of things. I think it's amazing. Um, she is here for the summer. Uh, the only thing I find annoying is that she always has these these meetings like every other day. I'm like, let's do this. She's like, well, I can't have a meeting at this time. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. I'll just sit outside in the living room and watch TV by myself then. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's helping to be inclusive and like helping to like end systemic racism in Fort McMurray and create inclusivity in the, a very man, white man oriented job site. And I'm sulking. <laughs> yeah. No, what she's really doing is she's standing like six feet away being like, are you on mute? Can I walk by? Is your camera on? That's really what's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a two bedroom and uh, my spare bedroom is Ella's closet. So my makeup counter is in there. So, and Sim is staying in there and she has her home office set up in there. So sometimes I'll peek around the corner and be like, is your camera off? <laughs> Cause she does a lot of meetings and she's like, yeah. And I'm on mute. I'm like, mute. <laughs> and I'm mute. So I was like, yes. I just, yeah. And sometimes I just walk around in my underwear, so I don't want to. <laughs> all of a sudden she's in a meeting and then I walk by. <laughs> yep. Anyways, yes, that's yes. great. I was like, I Do think we feel like we got a lot about who we ourselves out? I think so. I think there's a good intro. Um, next week we're going to talk about Indigenous Pride because next week is Indigenous Awareness Week. Yes. Wait, I want to do our and like I want to do our indigenous term of the word, word of the week. We didn't do any oh. indigenous teachings this week. I just want to throw it in there. Okay, yeah, go for yeah, it. Well, yeah. I mean, we taught all about the history of two spirit, but like, sure. No, no, no just like we did, but I mean, like we wanted. No, I said we wanted to do like we, traditional yeah, teachings. Yeah, we can do a traditional teaching as well. No, fine. You guys can we no, come no, next no, week? No, no, no. They want very, to hear now. That was don't. very colonial of you to stomp on my my words, Sima. Don't give them blue balls. <laughs> come on, let's go. Today's word of the day is blue balls. <laughs> well, like I like, I'm learning, I'm relearning my language, and um, it's something that was uh, 
during like the 60 scoop and residential schools, it was really beaten out of us and we lost a lot of our words. Uh, so we had to get a lot of our elders to piece together our language again. So it finally became a written one and it's being taught again, which is pretty awesome. But um, also our our language is very poly, polysynthetic, which um, means that like one word can mean a whole sentence. And also what it, what's great that I found out about my language recently is that uh, there's no genders in my language. Like it's everything is gender neutral. And the only way that they know who they're talking about is if it's said in context. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I like that. But anyways, like the word of the day, which I used to say all the time, it's called den, denta. Then like you'd say den. Denta. No, no, no. The T is pronounced with like, like a T-S. Then like S, like densa. Densa. Yeah, densa. Densa. And that means, uh, hello, how are you? Or like, hey, how's your day? Like it just, it's a, it's a greeting. And we should tell everybody this is in Dene. Yes, yeah, sorry. This is Cascadene, which is like an Athabascan dialect uh, in northern Canada. So more south. Northern BC and Northern BC and Yukon. southern Yukon. And then like a hint of um, Northwest Territories, but it's all within that area. Anyways, I just wanted to share that word. You'll be learning more words Dense. with us as we go around. No, tsa. Densa. 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 Yeah. And if you are in Kelowna, you can see us. Uh, tonight at Dorothy's, you were there tomorrow as well. Yes, and we'll both be performing on Friday. Yeah, Friday night, Sunday for brunch. Yeah, and uh, Sunday. Lots of time to see me, but also the big event this week. Yes, please come out to Dorothy's and support us. That's pretty amazing. We love that. The weekends are pretty good. Brunch is doing awesome. Uh, we do a lot of comedy and humor, which you got a hint of with us now. But the big thing that's happening this week, which is pretty fun, which is going to be happening on Unicorns Live as well, is that we are doing a Every Child Matters fundraiser for the Indigenous resi- or Indian Residential School Survivor Society. So we're going to be raising a lot of money for that. Hopefully it's at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll be having a link soon that you can pay $10, uh, and that's going to go right to the donation link. Or, yeah. And you can watch it. If you, or you can see us at Dorothy's. Yeah, so you can watch us live. Or if you are listening to this after Sunday, then you can go to unicorns.live to watch it afterwards. Mm-hmm. And, and can- I believe there might still be the, the donation link for a week afterwards, but we'll... We'll work that out. But um, for all you that subscribe to Unicorns Live now, you'll see a link for it soon to watch it. Oh, it's, it's up? up already. Oh, it's already up already, which is awesome. Um, like I said, pay, watch it with us because uh, I believe Unicorn su- subscribers already get to watch it, right? And then there will be a link to donate while you're watching. And it's going to be Indigenous performers, Indigenous empowerment, creating a night to celebrate indigenous art but also to raise money for an important um society yeah and it's not just drag it is a wide variety of indigenous yeah. artists so as of right now we do have drag we do have spoken word uh we have like a local artist that made a painting specifically for uh how how he, they were feeling when they found out about the the, the children at the Kamloops school so it's a beautiful painting that we're going to auction off and then we also have um live singing like bands yeah so yeah, so, y- so having said that, if anyone's watching and you're Indigenous and you want to take part, uh, we do have slots available to, to perform with us. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, you can follow us. Uh, I am on all social media at Simba Down. Mm-hmm. And I am on most social media as Casca Queen. That's K-A-S-K-A because my name is, uh, I'm from the Casca language and Queen K-W-E-E-N. I do get a lot of people asking why I have that strange name when I should name it Ella Lamra for easy to find. And my reasoning is because when I say Casca, I want people to ask me what it is so I can tell them about my beautiful culture. (laughs) Downside, I have to explain all the time, but that's fine. If it's hard to find me, like it's not too hard. Well, that that contradicted itself. You got it. Anyways, Casca Queen, most social media, LLM Ra on Facebooks, Simma Down on all social media because she's better at marketing than I am. (laughs) Yeah. And you can find us there. You can follow us. You can see what we're doing. And then you can stay up to date on what we're doing with this show as well. But for all you people watching right now, next week we are... What? Talking. Oh, next week we're talking about Indigenous Pride. I already (laughs) said this. I'm not paying attention. (laughs) (laughs) Next week we're talking about Indigenous Pride for because next week is Indigenous Awareness Week. Yes. Yes, it is. But, um... That's it, right? We're good. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, I hope everybody. Liked the first episode. I had a great time. I was just sitting here chatting with a friend. If there's anything you want us to talk about on future episodes, let us know. See. 
Nazi. <laughs> and Do you now, know how to say yes in um, um yes in uh, my language as well as hum? Hum. That's two words. You're, I just like why am I saying C, just right? I'm <laughs> just like I'm giving hum. you your, your guys got a treat. Yeah. You folks got a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.